This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven and it is so good to be back. I skipped the last upload so I can get ahead on a whole bunch of projects that I'm working on and I have in the works for 2021, a bunch of planning and scheming. But now that I'm back, we got some stuff to make. So this is where we're at right now. This thing's pretty good. The design works, it's easy to print, it's relatively simple, it makes sense. You don't need a bunch of weird, complicated parts to get it to actually spin up. They're all pretty accessible. I like the frame, it's in a good place. The motherboard, also great. It has some things that could be better, but these are things we talked about before. It's pretty good. And then feeders. These are also in a pretty good state. They haven't been as fully tested as I'd like, but the general process of how they work is working really nice right now. However, there are a few very specific things that keep them from being entirely functional. The first and easily the most duh problem is this stuff on top that handles peeling off the film 100% collides with the vacuum picking head while the camera moves over. So all this needs to be moved down and kind of back a little bit to make space for the nozzle to move up. The next is with these shenanigans. This does technically work pretty well with a spring that actually provides the force that peels the film off the tape along with having a physical mechanical switch. However, switches have a lifetime rating number of cycles and if this is happening every time a component is moved and picked forward, it's gonna wear out pretty darn quick. So ideally we'd use something that's solid state or doesn't have any moving parts, like a Hall effect sensor. And lastly, this feeder is designed to work with the voltage divider methodology of determining what slot it's in. After a ton of discussion in the Discord and weighing all the pros and cons, we're gonna use a one wire EEPROM. Long story short, it only adds one wire to the spring finger interface, one wire. Get it? So we don't have to get a bigger connector, which is much more expensive. It also is incredibly reliable. And lastly, an EEPROM can store a bunch of data. So if we decide we want to add a whole bunch of cool functionality, we can change that down the road. We're not limited to just that amount of data. Okay, first things first, we got to get the spool and the tension arm way out of the way of the head. So we're going to take those and we're just going to smoosh them on back a little bit, keep them all tucked away behind so they don't run into anything. Great. Next, we gotta slash those switches. Instead of using a limit switch, we're gonna use a TCS40 DPR Hall effect sensor. We're gonna mount this right along the top edge of the board, so right as the arm comes down, which there will be a magnet within, it'll go, ding. oh, I see a magnetic field. We're tension. Great, okay, so that's done. What else, what else? Uh, oh yeah, we're also gonna change the voltage that runs along the RS45 bus. So we'll make this board compatible with the 12 or 24 volts, like the main power input that drives the stepper motors on the motherboard. That means we're gonna have to add a five volt buck converter to step that down to drive the motors, and then we'll keep the same 3.3 volt LDO that we used before to power the microcontroller and the buttons and the lights and all that stuff. Second thing, we actually need to add the EEPROM. This means we're gonna have to spin up a new feeder floorboard. The last one was great and it was pretty simple, but it only had two little footprints for resistors for the voltage divider methodology. This time we need a footprint for the DS2431 one wire EEPROM, along with a little bit of blank white silkscreen space so we can write the ID number that's been programmed on it. Alrighty, that's probably it for the boards. Let's see, we also have to remodel everything in FreeCAD because everything in the future was still in Fusion. Oh yeah, uh, that looking good. Very spicy, very spicy. Let's send these boards out to get made, throw the parts onto the printer, and start putting it together.
First try! I love it when that happens. I know I've done it a bunch of times, but it always feels good when it just works the first try. Now you may have noticed that there's also three more LEDs along the top. Now that the feeder floors are going to have an EEPROM on it, there needs to be some kind of way to program it. You need to tell the EEPROM, hey, you're in slot one, and then tell the next one, you're in slot two. Now the easiest way to do that is to just use a feeder. Figuring out how to tell the feeder which address to program the feeder floor though, that's a little weird. I was thinking about putting maybe a little seven segment display or maybe an OLED or something, but it was all a little too expensive. I just decided to add three more LEDs. So now we have five and we can get, ooh. So these five LEDs let us pick one of 32 addresses. So there'll be a little mode in the feeder where you can click through. It will show you in binary with these LEDs, which address it's about to program and then press the buttons and it'll boom, imbue the feeder floor that it sees that it's currently connected to with that address. That means that if you wanna make some of these at home, you don't need to get a fancy extra board to program these feeder floors. You just use the feeder itself to do it right away. Now for this test I just did, I just wired five volts into where the feeder expects to see five volts. But next I'm gonna add in the whole buck converter situation. And then of course the Hall effect sensor. I'm really excited to try that and see how that works. Let's solder them all on. Wow. All right, all the extra components that add in all the little extra nuggets of functionality have been soldered onto the feeder board. Now, a lot of these really only work once we start putting some 3D prints on here. The guide for the left side perfectly spaces the indexing wheel away from the optical sensor. So that's kind of necessary along with perfectly spacing things out for the magnetic sensor. So we're gonna start popping on some prints and testing all these new features, making sure that they work all right. <laughs> <laughs> now this is awesome and cool and everything, but it's not really doing anything new from the last one. Sure, all this stuff is shifted back a little bit and it no longer collides with the head while the camera's looking at the parts. The magnetic sensor works super well for determining whether or not the film guide has like been pulled all the way down. I just put one single little magnet inside of the guide and when it comes to just about center point with the spool, it triggers, so it's perfect, perfect spacing. Also, it's running on 12 volts now instead of five, so the buck converter works really, really well. Those are all great, but that's not why we're doing this to begin with. The whole point of making this new feeder is to switch to the one-wire EEPROM. So let's solder up one of the new feeder floors with the DS2431 EEPROM and see if we can get this thing to recognize what slot it's in based on that. All right, let's do it.
Okay, so the feeder can program the feeder floor now, and it like totally can program. I do like don't even know how, how to phrase this. Okay, so the EEPROM totally works. It's so cool. It's such an awesome little chip. Not only can the feeder see what address is in the first byte of the EEPROM, but I also made a little UI with the buttons and the lights on the feeder to program it. And you can see if I reset it, it will see that its address is 11 because that's what I just programmed it into. Then if you press both buttons at the same time, all the lights will come on and then it will show you what address it sees on the floor currently. And then you can tap up or down and it will cycle through addresses in binary using the five LEDs to show you what address you'd like to program it to. Uh, let's pick eight. And then when we press both buttons at the same time to program it, it'll do the little programming flash sequence. Mm. So now that we know that the feeder floor can hold an address and the feeder can read it really easily and the feeder can even do the programming of the feeder floor itself, let's put it on the machine. The feeder can easily tell what slot it's in based on reading from the one wire EEPROM. It's actually really easy to check what address that it sees on the feeder floor. When you just hold down both of the buttons, it'll go into programming mode and it will by default set the address, the first address that it shows with the LEDs is the one that it sees on the feeder floor. So it's really easy to check and see what address it thinks it's at. I've spent a ton of time playing around with programming different addresses into these two floors and moving them back and forth and making sure that it reads the correct one every time. And so far it's been dead on. I love these little EEPROMs. They're such an awesome little chip. It's only one wire. Also with the last feeder floors, I had a whole bunch of cable harnesses that I was plugging into two JST XH connectors and it got really messy really quickly. With this one, I've switched over to using an IDC cable, which is just this long ribbon cable and you can take a connector and splice it in partway through. And I can just add as many as I want on here. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm so happy about this. So what's next? As a bit of a general project overview, the PP frame works really well. The motherboard works really well. The feeders now work really well. But the last thing is getting all three of them to talk really fluidly software wise. This means two things need to happen. One, we need to make a change to Marlin to support RS-45 so that it can talk to all the feeders and maybe other peripherals down the road. And two, we need to make a custom feeder type in OpenPNP. It technically can work without this and we can just use an existing feeder type, but we can utilize a lot more of our hardware and some cool functionality if we make our own. I wanna give a huge shout out to Martin and Justin for leading the charge on both of these two endeavors. They are much better programmers than I am and they've been instrumental in figuring out the best way to do this. Once that's complete, it's time to move on to some other stuff. We have done multiple iterations of every part of this machine so far, and it's in a good place. I think it's time that we get back to adding features. The two really big ones that are gonna make this machine just awesome are adding a conveyor belt and adding solder paste dispensing. When these two get added, it means that the index can automatically pull in a board, add paste automatically without the manual step of using a stencil, put the parts on, and kick it out the other side. This is gonna be huge for automating making boards in bulk. Alrighty, that's it for this one. I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to help support me and projects like The Index, there's a link in the description where you can become a patron. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. But before I go, I wanna thank this video's sponsor, PCBWay. They made some cool boards. I like, okay, I'm gonna be honest. I feel kind of bad submitting boards sometimes because I feel like there's an engineer at PCBWay who just like looks at my design file and is like, oh, what, 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 no, why? Like this but they receive the file and they find a way to make it 
and it came out really good. So if you're on the market to get some of your boards made, I highly recommend PCBWay. Thank you so much to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. That's a full bench. I have to make another bench now. All right, bench number two. The drive shaft on the TT motors has this weird kind of double... What? Hello. Hello? Check it out. I'm shooting a green screen shot right now. Hold on, let me turn off my camera one second. Okay. Uh, okay.